And welcome back to the Constitutionals Podcast. I'm your host, Chad White. If you didn't know, this is the premier podcast for the website, cpluscomedy.com. Like I just said, it's a website. Go there. Episode 312.5. Uh, that is very true. <laughs> I almost forgot where I was, what I was doing. What, do you remember where you were during those times? Where were you during the moon landing? I assume you're that old. Where were you uh, during all those times when Chad was clearly clicking around trying to find a song <laughs> on his iPad? <laughs> trying to find the, the, the cut to break song on his iPad. And he clearly found it. Anyway, here we are back at this again. I remember where I was for pretty much everything. Not pretty much everything, most things. I remember where I was when I did this uh, interview. Des Bishop. Usually at my <laughs> I roll into it and I and I talk for so long before I talk about who the person is. I talk I spoke with Des Bishop talking about his new comedy special of all people. I'm tightening it up. This is a re-release courtesy of 800 Pound Gorilla Media. We love them. They're great people. They're nice. And they choose good comedi- comedians. Comedians to, to curate. Des Bishop is a very funny gentleman. I'm uh, so glad I got a chance to sit down with him and talk to him. You may know him as, uh, I believe he's uh, an Irishman. God, I hope he's Irishman. And just the silver-haired guy also speaks Chinese. He, uh, or excuse me, Mandarin. I made that mistake. Don't cancel me. I made that mistake in the interview. I could just as easily restart this, but I'm not doing that. This is authentic, baby. <laughs> I can't believe people, people's people come back to me and say, hey, talk to this comedian because <laughs> they clearly don't listen to this part. <laughs> okay, let's try it again. Des Bishop, Irishman, Silver Fox, speaks Mandarin. He's a very talented man, and he's very funny. His material focuses on cultural differences, he noticed, when uh, uh, moving from uh, Irish society to Queens, New York at a very young age. He's lived in China, I believe, was it Beijing or Shanghai? It was uh, one of those areas. He's he's lived in China. He's lived in China, uh, spending one year there. To learn Mandarin, uh, spent another year in Ireland learning Irish. He's done full hours in both languages. When I tell you that he speaks different languages, this man truly speaks different languages. In fact, he starts off the special, and I'm gonna ruin, I'm gonna ruin a little bit a little bit of the magic for you. He starts off the special talking to a presumably uh, a Chinese audience member, and uh, he's speaking like truly. He did not plan this out. He just fully speaking Mandarin with the guy. And it's amazing. The entire table is, they're all, everybody should be flummoxed. I enjoyed it. Of all people is what the IRA was called. I know I spoke about our, look at me, I'm Irish. Nope. (laughs) Bad. This is third hour. I believe it came out last year. It's being re-released. Again, thanks to our friends over at 800 Pound Gorilla Media. Des has been famous all over the world prior to, to coming to America and being famous over here. He was uh, he rose to Irish fame with different shows over there. I would name them, but uh, I'm not going to because <laughs> I don't think you would know what they are. He dealt with testic- uh, t- t- Jesus. He dealt with cancer and uh, he's done the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. Again, he's done uh, uh, different shows thanks to China and Ireland. Ireland. There you go. That's pretty good. He's appeared on many different uh, live shows, including Live at the Comedy Store. He's married to uh, Hannah Burner. You might know who that is. She's a very popular comedian as well who put out her own special. He's a nice guy. and We had a great conversation Sometimes, you know, sometimes I talk to people and I feel like, and I'll, and I'll throw to the, I'll throw the interview in a second. <laughs> Let me do this. Sometimes I talk to people. I feel like I'm wasting their time. 
Uh, with this guy, I did not feel like I wasted his time. Uh, he was at his second house in the Hamptons. No big deal. <laughs> anyway, we had we had a lovely conversation. Because <laughs> I feel like he had time to spare if he's over there. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm uh, I, I'm glad I had a chance to sit down with talk with him. Uh, and he's and I got to tell you, his energy on stage is so uh, frenetic is not the word, but. Uh, yeah, I just say frenetic. It's very frenetic, and uh, I, it's just he's he is who he is on stage. He is who he is off stage. Uh, being in that they're the the same person essentially. Uh, he's he's got a way of speaking uh, that is just very encapsulating. Where if sometimes you hear about like a comedy club that's also like a, a restaurant that also has a comedy club, yeah. Uh, if you were eating dinner and he was doing comedy in the background, you'd be paying attention. He's a fun guy. So if you want to check this out, and I urge you, you should. You should uh, go ahead, listen to it wherever you get. On October 22nd, that's when it comes out. Excuse me. <laughs> it's not out now. Go listen to it wherever you get your uh, your audio versions of, of those things. Check it out wherever you get that. I'm definitely not clicking through trying to open up his social media accounts before <laughs> Before I get to this, um, if you want, so if you want to listen to it, if you want to watch it, I believe a version of it is currently on his YouTube page or on somebody's YouTube page. It is on his YouTube page. Again, this is a re release. So check it out. And it's one that I've watched. Yeah. You know it's good when I watch it. Check out desbishop.net to see all of his tour dates, to see, uh, to click on through his podcast, see videos. That's where you get everything. You can also follow Des Bishop over there on Instagram at Des Bishop. You can see his t- oh god oh god oh god it's playing. You can see his TikTok. <laughs> see his TikTok Des Bishop five. TikTok's all the rage now. We also talk about TikTok. Believe it or not, yes, I've been talking to every comedian I've talked to in the past year and a half. We've talked about TikTok because I bring it up because I want to know everybody's ideas of it. I dislike TikTok. And I just want to see who disagrees, who agrees, who can have a conversation about it. And so far, everybody has taken the bait, and we do talk about it. <laughs> no, he's good. He's a good guy. Uh, yeah, there you go. If you want to see a video version of this show, go to youtube.com slash C plus comedy, where you can see a, a video. Oh, it's not even. Oh, God, I meant I was trying to play this song, and it's not playing. Uh, you can see a video version of the show as well as the other podcasts, the uh, uh, the mainline version of the Constitutionals, and uh, uh, Late Night Lately, the Late Late Night Show show, um, and LinkedIn Logs, uh, the Jobs podcast. You can subscribe to those wherever you get your podcasts. You can follow us on TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at C Plus Comedy. I've done this for nine minutes now. And you can follow me on those platforms at Chad Black White. Thank you so much for listening. Of all people, Des Bishop, 800 pound Gorilla Media. Here it is, coming at you right now. I'm glad to hear that uh, of, of all the people is, um, I mean, it, it was just fantastic special to watch and everything. And I got to tell you, I don't watch uh, specials much anymore. And the fact that I sat down and, and watched this entire hour is just, it says a lot about uh, who you are as a comic. That's just, uh, oh. it was, it was great from top to bottom. Oh, thanks, man. I appreciate it. Thanks. What, uh, what went into, went into making it? Because I, I gotta say you came out just swinging, swinging, speaking Chinese. And then, <laughs> you know, 30 minutes later, you're talking about your testicular cancer. Well, now in fairness, the, the opening with the speaking Chinese, that was, I mean, if you pay attention, like it's a clip from later in the show. So that was actually a, a creative decision that my wife, Anna Berner, said it was slightly inspired by Shane Gillis's uh, YouTube special. I feel like he kind of opens with like a bit of crowd work and then just mm. goes to his special. So we were of the opinion that you just need to start. We didn't want any like walking on stage. So we thought, let's start with this bit of crowd work. Were you speaking in Chinese? And then people go. This is not what we're used to seeing. So right. You get their attention. And then in the edit, I decided with the, the guys that were editing, uh, that were working with me, that we would just, you know, ring a bell and then just go into the special. So there was like, you know, there's just, because 
I don't know, these days everyone is all about like, oh, nobody has an attention span. So we were trying to find the the way to start strongest and also like the least amount of, uh, you know, the least amount of nothing happening in right. advance of the show. Yeah. I think uh, you and Hannah made the correct decision in doing that because I think, you know, let's pretend I talked to 20 comics this year. You are like one of two of them that have just said, I got to start because it, there's so much pomp and circumstance when coming out with these specials. And, and you know, we have three minutes of clapping up top and then three minutes of clapping at the bottom. Like, no, I just want to hear the jokes. I'm ready to just get hit in the face with a bunch of jokes that are going to make me, you know, uh, double over while I'm sitting in my chair. And I think that you really do accomplish that. If people, if people were at that show that didn't know who you are, they definitely know who you are now. Yeah. So like, and then, it, you know, even the first bit is not the, I mean, I'm letting out all my secrets here, but the first joke in the special wasn't the first joke on the, on the night, you know, I just, okay. I, I just, uh, I, I, after the, but in fairness, even even when I was recording, I was I was planning to over record. Got a lot of material from a long time doing comedy a long time. Yeah. So I was planning to over record and then kind of like decide on the order uh, in the edit. You know, so mm. that this particular special, I've done shows where you know they're, they're very much a beginning, middle, and an end. But this was it. What this wasn't the greatest hits, but there was. A sort of a re re uh, reimagining of some older bits of mine from like my uh, my days of performing in Ireland. So yeah. I was really just trying to get the bits out as best as possible, and then deciding on the order after the fact. So particularly the first half of the special, there is a l a lot of jigsawing after the fact in, in what you actually saw. Yeah. How was writing, you know, bringing those bits from Ireland over to Americans? Because yeah, you can tell pub jokes because they can translate to bar things, but things that exist in Ireland don't really necessarily all the time exist here. So what was it like rewriting those for American audiences? Yeah, that just happened over time. So basically, like, you know, I started comedy in 1997, but until basically until 2016, I didn't really perform in the States every now and then, yeah. but like never for any length of time. So when I came back from China, I was just kind of like, I don't know, I had an itch to do more stuff outside of Ireland because like if you can if you can figure out how to make Chinese people laugh in Mandarin in China yeah and also make expats that are living in China laugh about China you know like I just was like I need to expand my horizons so anyway uh from just taking those bits out in the road like trial and error 2016 through to after the pandemic mm -hmm. it was a journey really I just slowly like figured out which bits work I mean I have hours and hours of material that does not work in the States. It's very yeah. Irish. And that material served me very well over the years, you know, outsider's point of view on Ireland. But eventually over time, you know, you you figure out the bits that are like universal and they work. And then to be honest with you, touring it in the States, like fresh audience, different, you know, you have to like, you have to rethink the stuff. It yeah. makes it all stronger. Yeah. So actually if you were, a, if you were a sleuth, you could, try to find my Irish special that I recorded back in like 2017. I recorded that in Ireland. And I mean, 30 or 40% of what you saw was also on that. But I, I promise you, if you watched that from 2016 to 2017, you would say all the bits that I saw were better than that because yeah. they ran the gaunt. I was able to, to travel around America and just, I don't know, make them, make them better. Plus people don't know me here. You know, in Ireland, I'm pretty well known. So I had to take all those bits to audiences who I had to win over. So you, you naturally just make it's a necessity is the mother of invention. Like I had to make those bits better to win the audience over. Yeah, it making making them better. I think you know it's like it's like uh, 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 making a sphere. If you're I don't know on Survivor or something, you, yeah, you, it's, uh, you know you, you got to sharpen the blade just over and over and over so you can fish better and and you know spear those spears better. I'm sure there's a point there, but uh, I said speaking Chinese earlier. I meant to say speaking Mandarin. And no, that, actually that's not a problem. It's funny. Okay. People always try to say not Chinese people, by the way, but. Uh, uh, a lot of people say, oh, it's Mandarin, not Chinese, but it's not really true. I mean, if you want to get super pedantic, mm. you know, you could you could argue, you know, that it's like not totally incorrect, but it's actually not offensive. For some reason over here that came this thing was like, oh, it's don't say Chinese, it's Mandarin. But when you're in China, 
and Chinese people are speaking English, yeah. they say your Chinese is good. They don't say your Mandarin is good. Right. Yeah. What when when you first heard uh, uh, your Chinese is good? What went through your head? Did you, did you ever feel that you you were finally a part like a part of those people? You're finally a part of the land. You're like I'm this fucking great person who can now go to three different continents and be able to fit in anywhere. Well, the bad news about it is they say your Chinese is good on day one. And when you're literally fluent and doing stand up in Chinese, so they're so polite that, you know, the first time I heard that actually my Chinese was not good. You know, oh, shit. I was getting the same compliments, you know, a year and two years later when, you know, I'm like living my life full time in Mandarin. But what 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 was satisfying was, you know, when I was able to perform like, you know, properly to uh, Chinese audiences in Mandarin, that's when I was like, oh, I mean, I never thought that my Mandarin was amazing, but it was definitely good enough to have strong shows like I had. There were times where I was killing in Mandarin and that, that was very satisfying. Yeah. Is there anything that you miss from over in China or over in Ireland that we don't have here, be it food or just like audience types or anything? Well, Ireland, I, I go back and forth still all the time. So, oh, cool. okay. yeah, and all my best friends. I mean, I, you know, I still, I, I had never intended to leave Ireland as I, I hadn't intended to move back to the States full time. I just happened to meet Hannah during the pandemic. But China, I mean, there's so much about China that I miss because there's a chaos there that you kind of get into, you know, yeah. uh, there's like eating culture. Obviously, you know, I, I don't just mean like Chinese food, but just mm. there's like an eating culture, like the importance of, of food over there. I kind of miss, like I miss the Beijing summers like sitting outside. I was talking to Ari Shafir recently on his podcast and he had been over. I met, I actually met Ari in China, uh, China originally. That's actually how I know him. And uh, we were reminiscing about, you know, just sitting on crappy little, crappy little plastic benches eating like <laughs> lamb skewers uh on the chinese you know that that's kind of that's kind of like they're going out you know yeah so um i, I miss that i miss the high speed rail mm, <laughs> high yes. speed rail pretty cool you know yeah. i got an amtrak i got an amtrak to philadelphia recently like and it was just delays and i was just like <laughs> oh my god the one thing about china it, it's the, the bad thing about a totalitarian state mm -hmm. is that they can do whatever they want. Uh, but on the flip side, you end up with incredible infrastructure because they just tell people like, sorry, you're not allowed to live here anymore, which is horrific. But right. the structure was incredible. Yeah, yeah. And it's like they can build a bridge in a week and it'll yeah. be a sound bridge. And you go, holy shit, like I can drive my car over this and, and feel comfortable about not dying. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, this isn't a criticism of America because we have like property rights here. But it w when I was living in Beijing, I was only there for two years. And I like two subway lines, new full subway lines were completed while I was there. And we couldn't get like five extra stops on the queue in New York over like a decade. Yeah. Um, so there was there was there, like that stuff is amazing. I mean, how it's created is not amazing. But when you're actually using the infrastructure, you're like, wow, this infrastructure is like the high speed yeah. rail is incredible. Yeah. You you mentioned the, the chaos that China brought. But being somebody who lives in New York, do you live in New York proper or do you live in Queens or are you at the Hamptons right now? Well, right now I'm in the Hamptons, but. I have I live in the Lower East Side normally. Lower I'm only here for a couple of hours. Yeah, I just had to come out and check on something. But uh, I I have a place in the Lower East Side. But, it, but so I in Queens is like is is that does that like living in Manhattan does that bring the same type of chaos that that uh, China kind of had? Because you you can go out and get food anytime. You can have audiences whenever. You can go up. You can go out find entertainment somewhere. So does that kind of scratch that itch in a way? I, it's definitely not the same. Right. Um, just Asia in general. I mean, China is very Chinese, but mm. but more Pan Asian culturally. There's just there's just a different feeling that's hard to recreate. I don't know. I don't know how to articulate what I you know what it is. But like when you're in it, it just it feels different. You know, um, it and it, some of it's not great. Like the way that they drive and everything. I don't mean like from the stereotype of Chinese people can't drive, but I mean from the <laughs> The culture of driving in in Beijing is it, yeah. it's a little like you know haphazard and um, you know there's like 
China has this like like lack of planning mm. uh, that just makes like really weird stuff like like some really nice restaurant will be in the middle of like a you know like like a bunch of government building like it won't make any sense but it'll yeah. be amazing. So a lot of a lot of what I loved about China was that it just doesn't make sense. But when you embrace that, it's like refreshing to go like, oh yeah, you don't need as much order. Yeah. <laughs> you don't need as much order as we thought, you know. So it's I you don't really get that sense of it being recreated uh, in New York. But I mean, New York, I love New York. It's just I don't get my um, I don't really. I mean, I get a little bit of Chinese food. It's like the reason why I picked my apartment Lower Side because near Chinatown, or, mm -hmm. you know, like I get I speak Chinese with people in the park and stuff like that. But like I don't, it's not, it's it's not the same. The chaos, of Asian, yeah, it's just different. Not not Japan. Japan's very ordered. Yeah. Where where do you like to eat in the Lower East Side? What what are your favorite places to order from? Oh well, you know, there used to be a place called Spicy Village, which was just down on Forsyth Street, but they shut down, which. Uh, it disappointed me. I'm a big fan of the Xi'an Ming Chi, the, the Xi'an famous foods, but it's kind of like a chain, but they have very good, uh, like authentic Chinese. Uh, they have the Rojia Mo, which is like a Chinese hamburger. Okay. Um, I think, I don't know what they, I think they might call them like human lamb bun in English. Okay. It sounds pretentious, but there's actually certain foods that I got used to eating in China that I actually don't. I, I don't have the English for them, but I think they call them a lamb cumin bun. Um, there's also a great little Lanjo uh, pulled noodle place on the corner of East Broadway and Allen, or I guess down there they call that maybe Pike Slip. But mm. um, coincidentally enough, it's underneath a place that got raided by the FBI because it was actually uh, like an outpost of the Fujian police. They were spying on uh, Fujian people that were living in New York. <laughs> Damn, that's crazy. But that, I mean, you know, they, you, can read about that. you can read about that in the New York Times. That's a real story. <laughs> okay, I look, I'm gonna look it up because I, that that the food must have been good because those police officers must have gone to that restaurant every single day, like no doubt. The food's good, man. But I mean, there's there's so much good. Like like Flushing, obviously, is the best place to get Chinese food. But mm. even in Manhattan, like there's so many Chinese students at NYU, students in Columbia, like. These kids, they're all going to like nice, good, authentic Chinese food restaurants in Manhattan. There's one in the East Village. Uh, it's a Sichuan place. I, I I forgot the name of it, but I've been there before. Like there's just so many good, authentic Chinese places that like didn't exist back in the day. In fact, I was in Madison, Wisconsin. There's a lot of, a lot of Chinese there too because of the university. Mm -hmm. And I went to this Sichuan place. I actually stopped a Chinese kid on the street. And I was like, Yo, where's good to eat? I asked some Chinese... So he told me to go to this place and inside was all Chinese students. And yeah. on the menu was all the stuff that I wanted to eat. And then the last page, it said American Chinese food. It literally oh. was separate, you know, chicken and broccoli, General Tso's chicken. It had its own section on the oh menu. My God. Let's, 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 let's call a spade a spade. This food is different. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds disgusting that's because like especially coming from somebody who has had the authentic stuff to to go back and, and see just the regular most boring basic style it's one of the great conflicts of uh hannah likes american chinese food and right. hannah's, hannah's dad likes american chinese food so they're always like you order in chinese but then i i order all the shit that i like from china and they hate it they won't eat it <laughs> <laughs> is it do, do you like the spicy stuff or are you you want yeah, I like it all man I like it all and I got even more into it from being there and Sichuan you know the the mala as they say the the numbing spice I don't know if you ever had that with the peppercorns no. makes your mouth buzz your mouth actually yeah. kind of buzzes the first time I ate it in China I didn't know what was going on you know because it was like we're going for Sichuan food I thought we were I, I was expecting like hot like like what we know as hot yeah. spice but then I had a feeling I'd never had before this this mala, this peppercorn feeling that like it numbs your mouth. You actually, your mouth starts to like buzz and tingle. And the first time you taste it, it's kind of weird. And then you get addicted to it. Like I'm addicted yeah. to it. Ugh, geez. We don't see, I'm in Atlanta and we don't have uh, mm -hmm. any like really good Chinese food nearby. There's a, another city called Doraville that's like 20, 30 minutes away that has like a line on Buf a place called Buford Highway that's just like all Korean, Chinese, Japanese. I, I just read it. There's an article in the, I think in the Atlantic or in Politico about 
how the the Koreans, which I think was there, the mm -hmm. Korean community in near Atlanta, were are uh, they're 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 leaning away from the Democratic Party. But anyway, I think they were talking about that area that you were talking about. Yeah, yeah, it's and it and uh, unfortunately, it's like not even walkable. So you still have to drive there, and then yes. you have to like decide to go to whichever restaurant you can. You can pop in obviously with a car, but that kind of stinks. That defeats the purpose. Like I'm living in Atlanta, I want to walk around and go and try out different places. Yeah, well, you know, let's like people aren't going to Atlanta for Chinese food, so that's all right. <laughs> that's true. That's some nice Southern food, you know, some yeah. soul, food, man. Yeah. Uh, the oh, also, I had, the first time I ever had collard greens was in uh, Atlanta. Really? What'd you think? Had them. Only if you, only like a year and a half ago. Really? Oh my yeah. God! What'd you think? What? How did it feel I, like? To... I liked it, you know. Okay. But like, you know, it, to me, it's it's like a reasonable accompaniment. But it it wouldn't be like my 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 pick of like the most amazing stuff. You know? Yeah. Was... Yeah. Uh, there's a bunch of restaurants that were added to the Michelin star list and like the cheap Michelin star list or cheap Michelin eats list this past year. And it's been, it's, 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 it's interesting to see Atlanta for the first time reach that list and, and see a boom that kind of feels like it's in New York or LA and, or Chicago and make it feel like one of those cities on, on the same tier making really good food. And is it like, are some of them like, like authentic, like, like, a um, fancy versions of local cuisine is this is this happening yeah unfortunately there's a lot of that and uh, a lot of like french stuff a lot of european oh, things right. that i just thought that you know i the because they again they have two they have like the fancy one then they have like the uh here are the ones where everyone can afford and i live across the yeah. street from one of those and it's busy like from saturday to sunday it's the busiest i've i've ever seen a place and it's it's so interesting to to watch like these fancy restaurants that have been around for a little bit and and see the food kind of be pretentious and then see like a biscuit place, you know, just yeah. exceed. And I just think, you know, all right, great. We we have we have both of these, but now what? I want to I want to be able to like to to bandy between both of them and, and maybe like get stuff that's in the middle too, so that everybody well, I want can. a Michelin star southern food place, you know? That's yeah. A real, like, yeah, yeah, like a real mission. Like, yes, de definitely. I would definitely want to see like a, a Gordon Ramsay style Southern food restaurant with the fried chicken, the collard greens, yes. the and cheese, all that stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask about, uh, of all the people, is it, so there's a re-release, I've been told. There's a re-release with 800 Pound Gorilla Media. Um, how have you been approaching that? Because I knew that, I knew the special when it came out eight months ago, but now that you have this uh, uh, Grammy consideration, all this stuff, you want you wanted people to drive interest. How has that been for you uh, lately with with all that? Well, you know, to be honest, when I, by the way, it's of all people, it's actually kind of like a, it's a joke because I went to the MTV Music Awards with Hannah, and an Irish tabloid wrote about it, and they said Des Bishop of all people showed up at the MTV Music Award, so. <laughs> It's it's actually of all people. It's the you know the way people say that sometimes, like yeah. you know, of all people. Yeah. So anyway, uh what happened was I put it out, and then within two weeks, I think, I tore my ACL skiing. Uh and I had to get surgery and I had to go to Ireland. So I never really promoted properly, other mm -hmm. than the clips did awesome. I mean, the bigger thing from the special is that the clips that I put up couldn't have done better you know yeah. special did fine on youtube but the clips did incredible but i never did the run of podcasts and uh, you know i never i'm not great with youtube so when 800 pound gorilla asked if you know if i would be interested in re-releasing it with them i was i was more than happy i mean the grammy consideration thing is you know, I was told to post and I posted and like 25% of the people think I've been nominated for a Grammy, which is not the case. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, I don't know who votes, but hopefully some of them see it and go, oh, yeah, I like that guy. Let me let me check his special out. Maybe I'll give him a vote. You know, you yeah. just step out. You're not in. You can't win. Yeah. They, I mean, think of how many people have put out a special this year and then also yeah, who aren't putting in their name into the bucket. And then they then they always wonder why, oh, I lost to Louie, I lost to Dave, I lost to Amy Schumer, you know, just like, no, just it, it's okay to try just a little bit. And I, and I think 
that's what you're 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 excelling well, at. When I when I put the album together, because a lot of times people don't submit because they actually never make an album, right? They never they never convert their YouTube special into the audio, release it, right? Which you have yeah. to do. But I told them when I was doing that, like whatever, a few months ago, I said, I just want to be considered for the Grammy. I said that's really all I care about, you know. Not I, I didn't I didn't think I was going to be nominated, but I wanted a, a chance. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I, I so so that was actually my main goal on the making it into an album front, you know. And it's you know, listen. Sometimes people crank it on Spotify, and that's great. And the clips go up on Sirius XM, and that's great. And you know, it's just another way to get your name out there. But. Um, as far as the 800 pound grill thing goes, it, the, for me personally, it just gives me a chance to promote it properly because I really yeah. did not do any of that. Yeah. And and what's it? And, you know, and sharing the clips, I'm looking at your, your Instagram, uh, getting ready for this interview and sharing the clips. It's yes, the special is shot so well and you're putting up the exact right stuff. But now, now that you're promoting it, uh, what are you seeing, you know, people are saying about how you do your comedy and, and what are they saying about the jokes? Do they love them? Because I got like there, there wasn't one part of this special where I was I thought you were uh, uh, peddling. You know, I just thought I was like, man, this guy is there's there's joke after joke after joke. Like I, I'm smiling the whole way through this morning. Well, my agent, when I sent it to him, like while we were editing, so mm -hmm. early version, not not of this, like back in uh, December, or January. I, I I sent it to him for some notes and he said, you know, when it started, I was I was gonna send you the note like you 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 know you you can't start this hot because you won't be able to keep it up. And then he said, but but you kept it up <laughs> the, the yeah. whole time. But that's just like an energy thing. First of all, it's at the cellar, so it's like a very, you know, it's a hot room. That room is hot, you know. Mm. And I don't know why, like during the pandemic. I I wrote a lot of material that's not in the special actually that kind of came and went like pandemic material it was like of a moment yeah and I was actually going to record that quick like a pandemic special but there was so much vitriol around issues around the pandemic when I posted one or two of those clips I was just like you know that intense anger around whatever issue was bothering people and masks and different things so I uh I said, you know what? I don't need this in my life. So I never actually recorded, uh, like I never properly recorded like that pandemic material. But anyway, I, I I came back after the pandemic with like an energy. I was like frustrated and I had a lot of lot to say yeah. about things. And uh, I don't know, it kind of like my performance style did actually like shift a little bit. And then that energy uh, leaned itself into some of those routines. I mean, some of them, as I said, were old, but they all got, they definitely all got an injection of energy. Mm -hmm. uh, and also because this wasn't like, uh, this this special is not like a show that I was touring. It's basically like a collection of closers. So they all have that kind of energy of, I could close on this. Yeah. Oh. Uh, which... You know, I'll never I'll probably never be able to do that again. <laughs> you know, like I, I had a lot to I had a lot to choose from in it. So, you know, like the the one bit that I had never recorded, that bit about, you know, going down and you know, like yeah. that 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 bit did really well. But like that was that was the bit that I needed to record. Like I'd never actually that's never been on anything ever. Mm. So I was like, I gotta get this done. But then other bit, but I I close on. Like I'd say 60% of that special has been a closer of mine in the last five or six years, you know? Okay. That's, that's a good way to put it. Uh, it's from somebody who is looking into your world of, uh, of, of how you write your stuff, because I mean, everything just, you're right. That energy was so palpable and I, I really enjoyed it. And I think the audience really enjoyed it too. And yes, some, it was I mean, a hot some room. people can't handle it. You know, some people like, they don't like that kind of intense. Like they think it's like shouty and all that stuff, but that yeah. that's all right. Cause I've always liked the, I always like the strong comics. Like I always yeah. like the comics that come at you. To be honest, man, all my comedy heroes, black dudes, man. It's like hey, Richard Pryor, Eddie Murphy, mm -hmm. Chris Rock. Like I always loved black comics. And I mean, it's a stereotype, but I think it's true. They all have energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, like, those are the guys that inspired me, and like 
I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm a black comic, but like, I like, you know, I like performing with other black comics, like black comics that aren't famous. I like that energy. And I'm not saying they all have that, mm -hmm. but I think the energy that I'm talking about that probably obvious to people, I, I love that. You know? Yeah. Those are the, and like in those three comics, those are three guys. Let's go back to the Apollo who could perform at the Apollo, control that crowd, who is who are notorious, notoriously loud and rowdy and 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 everything. And I think if you come out with that same energy, you could do the same thing. I think Bill Burr would be right up there with the same type of uh, ability of being able to go out to the Apollo in 1989 and tell people to shut the fuck up and yeah, still well, tell jokes. He did do it to white people on an Opie and Anthony show, which was a similarly like hostile crowd. And that was a famous, I mean, I don't know, you, you seem pretty young, but I don't know if you know about that. That That's like a famous gig that he was, he went out for an Opie and Anthony show in Philadelphia and it was a horrific crowd and they were booing him and he won them over. Like, it's so, like, if you ever get a chance to watch it, like, it's so funny because- yeah. You, you have to watch. I'm not going to do any of his jokes, but like, <laughs> but I, I 100% ag agree with you. But funnily enough, Bill Burr is actually not one of my inspirations. And I'm getting a lot of people saying that I'm, I'm like Bill Burr, which I don't, I don't mind because I really like him. Yeah. But actually, I, I haven't ever watched like a full Bill Burr special. Like, and in the later years of my comedy, I don't really sit down and watch specials. So when people ask me like who inspires me, it's always people from my childhood and like, the the nineties and two thousands that are really the ones that like, you know, influence me, not yeah. guys that I bump into at the cellar, you know? Yeah. Do you think uh, there's going to be a, a kid in 10 years who's like 22 years old and they're like, uh, who inspires you? And it's going to be some TikTok comedian who is just only does his crowd work. And, and that person <laughs> doesn't know how to write a joke. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, the industry's changed a lot. Like, I mean, I, a lot of that stuff doesn't frustrate me as much as it frustrates all the comics because, you know, like the game just changed, you know what I mean? So the, the, those people got, some people got lucky enough to realize that like, oh, you post these like frivolous clips of, of crowd work and they fly yeah. and, uh, and it worked for them, you know? So it's just kind of like right place, right time. A lot of the time. Uh, I also think that like younger comics, uh, they they don't have an advantage, but when it comes to online content, like it's more innate to them mm -hmm. to be to think visually. You know what I mean? Like I'm pretty I'm not bad at it now, like with the content and the clips, but like I was a I was an ocean liner, a slow turn uh to get my my head into that zone of like understanding not just visually what works and how to make it look right, but even how to like start performing and writing in a way that's like slightly more uh you know beneficial for when you actually do clips so yeah. you know i mean the crowd work thing like that was also just a moment in time like you just go with the flow with these things like they just it just happens and some people get lucky i mean look at look at logan paul and jake paul i mean these guys like they were there in the early days of vine and mm -hmm. you know they just figured it out and now they're like multi multi-millionaires for for what like for nonsense you know but like yeah. at the end of the day like it's it's a moment in time they ran with it they figured it out and then they understood the business enough to keep it going you know i think that there's nothing you can do about that so it doesn't it doesn't frustrate me at all the the crowd work stuff and all that like i'm 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 fine with it yeah that's definitely a good way to put it and you know it's i'm uh, hannah and i are around the same age and not to compare you know us uh or you know me and her or you and her it's she's like it's somebody who's young but also good at the internet like i it took me forever to learn how to cut stuff for tiktok which i which i just got for c plus comedy maybe a year ago and i was so late to the party and you know you I, if i look at my account and then hannah's account it's just bananas different bananas bonkers and then you know, you and her, she, you, there, there are two different ones, but I think you're doing uh, just as well because you finally picked up the the rhythm and the tempo, and it's it's different for everybody. And I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't relegate it to just an age thing because I have no interest in learning how to be better at TikTok. I just kind of want to get the shit and then put it out. Yeah, there. yeah, yeah. Well, I think too. What well, in terms of Hannah, that people don't realize is that her first job, like she she was a tennis player, and then. She had like a, a just a boring like sales job, but her mm -hmm. first job in like the world of entertainment was 
making content for Betches. And that was like a baptism of fire. But it was yeah. long before she got into stand-up comedy. So she was thinking about being funny on the internet mm. long before she started doing stand-up comedy. And as it turns out, that skill is more important than stand-up. <laughs> actually, you know, she was a, she was actually ahead of the game. Like some people are like, oh, she's doing it that long. And it's like, yeah, but she's doing what matters longer than you. That's the thing. <laughs> I love that. That's a great way to put it. Uh, well, Des, I don't want to take though? up- Who knew though? That's the thing. Who knew? We didn't yeah. know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, well, Des, I don't want to take up any more of your time. This has been a fantastic conversation. You are the same person on stage as you are in real life. This is, that's uh, truly, you're just a very funny guy. And I'm so glad I got a chance to A, watch your special and B, get to know you a little bit more. Well, thank you so much. Nice chatting to you, man. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you have a great rest of your day and uh, enjoy enjoy this uh, special uh, and, and all the good Emmy considerations, you, Grammy considerations you get from it. All right, great, man. Nice yeah. to meet you. See you, See bro. You.